How can a pitcher use his height to increase velocity and release the ball closer to the plate? It has nothing to do with stretching out the stride. And in fact, striding too far can have the opposite effect. You'll learn how to troubleshoot and fix this flaw, as well as learn how pitchers can self-correct mechanics during a game. And Angel has one more tip for the changeup. Thank you for downloading Season 5, Episode 5 of Baseball Pitching the Fix. I am your host, Joe Janish, and with me, as always, is baseball pitching motion expert Angel Borelli. And we are here in the middle of June, just after the MLB draft. And Angel, how are we doing today? We're doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I think we're going to have a really good show today. There's a lot of different things going through my mind. I'm sure the same thing is going with you. And one thing that I wanted to bring up in our first segment here, where we have lessons from Major League Baseball, I was watching a baseball game with the Yankees and the Mets, and Luis Severino, one of my favorite pitchers, was on the mound. And there was something that they were talking about with him. He's really one of the top pitchers in baseball. And and one of the things that the broadcasters was saying was that one of the things that makes him such an elite pitcher, besides the fact that he can throw 100 miles an hour, which by itself kind of helps him be as good as he is. But they said that one of the things that he can do that a lot of pitchers don't is that he can self-correct on the mound in the middle of the game. Now, that struck me because being in baseball for as long as I have uh, and coaching for you know 25, 30 years, one of the things that always comes up, whether it's a batter or a pitcher, it's that you don't want to be thinking about your mechanics. You do that sort of thing when you're in the bullpen or in the batting cage and you're working on things. But when you're actually in the game, what you should do is just let your body do what it learned to do in practice to just react to the game. And so it kind of struck me. I was like, you know, how can a pitcher self-correct himself without thinking about his mechanics at the same time? And I'm thinking now, if he's thinking about his mechanics, then he's not really letting his body do what it should do. And so I was a little confused about this. And since you're the pitching motion expert and you work with a lot of pitchers that I'm sure have had this come up, I figured I would bring it to you. So tell me, how can a pitcher self-correct on the mound when they really shouldn't be thinking about their mechanical adjustments? Well, I love you brought this up, plus the fact that I'm a diehard Yankees fan, and I love Severino as well, and they've talked about this about him in the past, and I actually heard them say that, and I loved that they said that, because what I would want the take-home message to be to any pitchers that are listening to this is that you have to be able to make an adjustment or make a correction. In fact, they use the term self-correct, which I loved which maybe is a little less scary as make an adjustment, but you're on the mound. You've got so many outs to get. You do something. You're starting to see a pattern. What we hope for, what I do with my pitchers is I give them personal information about what they are doing when they see the ball telling them that they're not doing something right. The feedback you get around the plate from what the ball does tells you if you're doing okay. When a pitcher's pitch starts going awry, and I'm talking about you've set a pattern, you're doing great, and then all of a sudden there's trouble. And when I say trouble, I mean not that you threw one ball outside or one pitch didn't work, but all of a sudden maybe it's the seventh inning, you've come in, and all of a sudden your command is gone. If that pitcher has been trained correctly, and this is what I would love to see for pitchers, he should have sort of a, 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 a go-to list of, in fact, the list should be one thing that he tends to do that causes this problem. And this is the beauty of, of always working with your mechanics, it, which is what any, any skill, anybody who has a skill, we should always be improving it. I don't care if it's athletic or not. So, the, so we want pitchers to be able to have something to go to because, guys, you can't just dig yourself in a hole, then jump in and then pull dirt down on your head. You should be able, in between the pitches, you've got about 20 seconds to, like, hone the skill to where, uh-oh, my fastball is starting to do this, and then you think about it. Now, it's not that you're thinking about your mechanics per se. You're making a connection between two things. You're connecting dots. And the important thing is, is that you don't think while you are doing it. 
You see, you have to learn, in addition to having the little list, so where you're connecting dots, you have to learn how, look at it, look at what happened, observe it. You got to stay neutral through all this too, by the way. You can't be like yelling at yourself. Actually, this keeps you from yelling at yourself. Observe it. Uh, What was that connection? Oh, yeah, I tend to lean over too much or I lean back when I'm doing this. And then you let it go. You act as if by just acknowledging it that the computer takes it and then you make the correction. Where thinking on the mound gets bad press is because in science, you know, some concepts in science, which of course are true, can be extrapolated and thought about in ways that make thinking uh, like a bad thing. If, uh, if you're thinking while you're moving, any guy out there who's tried to learn how to dance, uh, or if you have ever tried to learn agility drills, like running through uh, forms through ladders, um, when you do ladder drills on the ground, if you're thinking about, okay, I go one step to the right and two here, You're using a part of the brain where when the signal goes to the muscle that's moving, it takes the long way around the block. Once that movement is moved into the part of your brain, the motor control center, where it becomes a pattern, it goes from your brain right to the muscle. So you don't feel fluid when you're learning how to do steps or to do a certain thing. That is why thinking and yelling at yourself while you're pitching changes the part of the brain you're using and therefore your motion won't be right. And if your motion's not right, your pitches aren't going to be right. So yes, we want you to be able to self-correct. You do it in between pitches. You learn to observe, connect the dot, let it go, and then you pitch and then you have the best chance for making, uh, uh, you know, a change in what has started to be a bad performance. And athletes need to learn how to do this. And once they understand uh, this concept, the truth is they're all thinking on the mound. Most of them are yelling at themselves. The beauty of this is it also gives you something else to do. The minute you start to just do this, and let's say you have a little safety net, you know, I call it having an emergency toolbox on your belt. I tell the guys, You should have an emergency toolbox. When your slider does this, this is what you're doing. When your fastball does this, this is what you're doing. And these guys get it inherently because they've had the issues during a bullpen. They saw what a correction could do. But every pitcher is like a car, gets out of whack. It can get out of whack within, you know, you could be pitching great for two hours and then all of a sudden, you know, you've just lost something and you just have to be brought in. As, does this always work? Maybe not. But what else are you going to do? You know, you can't just pray. So anyway, I love that they said that. And I hope this gives permission to pitchers to do some self-correcting. But the, but the first thing you have to do is when you're doing your practice bullpens, they should be productive. If you have a problem, if your catcher says, hey, you know, your ball's cutting or it's doing this or whatever, and you and your pitching coach says, okay, do this and you correct it. Don't just go, oh, yay. Go, okay, that's what I do that makes the ball do this. And trust me, the menu is different for each pitcher. But this is the kind of work and connections you should be making off the mound, you know, not on the hill. This is when you're pitching. And so anyway, I love that he said that, and I love that we're discussing it because uh, pitchers need to do this. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like you're not going to be thinking between every single pitch. It's just if you if you start to hit some issues where maybe you you just keep throwing your slider too far to the left or something like that. It's like you, you something that you should start thinking once you have something going wrong on the mound. Is that do I is that what I'm getting here? Well, or? when you when you have a pattern emerging and you know it's emerging because you start to get upset. No pitcher throws one pitch and misses and has starts to get upset. But if all of a sudden you go, my changeup isn't working today or something's happening, let's say you're in a practice bullpen, when something is awry and you're searching for the adjustment, start to make the connection when you find it and then 
yes, you uh, should be able to uh, have this to take to the mound with you. But this isn't to overreact. I mean, I am saying this assuming that as a pitcher, you have the head for pitching. Now, we're talking about a major league pitcher here. These guys are there because they have the emotional component that makes a good pitcher. For you amateur pitchers that are out there who are, you know, you're in college or high school, if you're yelling at yourself on the mound, then you need to work on your the head for pitching because that yelling gets in the way of your turning any situation around. And what major league pitchers do, and this is what they're paid to do, is they're paid to pitch, but they're paid to turn around a bad situation if they get in one. We expect them not to fall apart after they give up a home run because we know that's part of baseball. So keep your head on straight and assuming that it's on straight, Use your time productively when you have, you're not overreacting to an error, but to where you're observing, oh man, my fastball has stopped locating. And, uh, and every pitcher who has pitched knows when that time comes. Okay, so let's say you're the coach or even the catcher and you're seeing an issue with a pitcher. Can you go out to the mound and say, hey, let me just remind you of this and get them thinking about it. Or is no, that, I would never no. have it be third party. This has to come uh, organically. In other words, a pitcher who's hearing this right now, there's going to be pitchers going, Oh no. I mean, you never want the input that comes externally is a completely different type of input. This is why I tell fathers, please don't yell at your sons on the mound. Please don't yell at them when they come off the mound. Please let them have their experience. And as young pitchers grow up and they have the experience, that's why we like to see, that's why nobody gets upset when a pitcher gives up a home run. I mean, you you might be concerned for the score, et cetera. But what you're looking for is how does he handle it? And you can't learn to handle it. So that's why everything's got to be internal. You know, pitchers are internal. That's why parents say, my kid never talks to me. Well, his, his style is to be internal. That's why he can handle being on the mound. But he's got, this has all got to come organically. So there's some pitchers right now that are listening going probably, you know what? This is a good idea, and, and I didn't even think about it. And it's true. Every time I'm in a pen and I have this problem, I tend to do this. So, oh, you know, and they'll have the freedom and permission to do it and then let the thought go and then dial yourself for your pitch, trusting that your body heard you and you're making the adjustment. But there's some pitchers that are listening right now that might say, God, I'm not ready to do that. You know, I, I, I'm too nervous when I'm on the mound. And that's okay because that means you're just still learning how to have the mental composure and the emotional composure. But this segment is called What We Learn From the MLB. And the guys that are really good at it, they have the capability of doing this. So have that switch where you can connect a dot and then let it go. And none of this has to do with critiquing, criticizing, or yelling at yourself. It's a neutral sort of thing. The way I look at a pitcher, you know, I look and I see something. I don't go, oh, my boy, that is so bad. I just go, oh, he's doing this. I've got to go fix it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. You know, and it, you know, really uh, opened up my eyes as far as from being a coach or a catcher, not to bring something like that up in the middle of a game. Just they have to figure it out for themselves. It's how you get better. And it's how you don't pull the, the dirt down on your head. You know, baseball is a game where you can't predict what's going to happen. Things are going to happen. You need to know how to get go through it. You need to know how to not make it worse. And if you can turn it around, awesome. So this is a skill. And those pitchers that have the skill or the ability to do this, they're going to take this information and run with it. And those that aren't ready yet, just know when you're ready, when your head's that together, you'll be able to make those, uh, to have that as an arsenal. It should be like another pitch, the one you have in your pocket for yourself that reminds you. I'm really glad that we're talking about this because as a coach, it can be very tempting when you see a pitcher doing something incorrectly 
to go out to the mound. I mean, we have the ability, the luxury of having coaching visits to the mound and you want to tell your pitcher something and you want to do something constructive. And I guess the way I'm going to think about this is that a coach would never go to a batter in the middle of an at-bat and say, hey, uh, you know, you, you need to keep your head down a little little longer while you swing through the pitch. You know, like you, you just have to let them do it. And I guess that's the same thing you have to yeah. do with the pitchers and you have to make sure that that's something that they develop on their own in their own practices. Just like you said, as whether, you know, you're trying to break off a good curveball, you have to learn how to make the adjustments mm-hmm. while you're yeah. doing practice and doing your bullpen. Okay. So let me qualify this a little. So, uh, you know, you mentioned the catcher going to the mound. Uh, let's say uh, there's a, a pitching coach and a, his pitcher that have a relationship and the pitching coach and pitcher, for example, I know absolutely that if I were sitting in a dugout in a game with one of my best pitchers who I've worked with forever And if he walked in and I saw that he was doing a certain thing, I would have a way, and let's say he's starting to really mess up, I would have a way in three words or less to say, you're doing that thing, just just, just think about it. And he'd be like, thanks, and then he'd go make the adjustment. So this isn't to say that a coach, when you see your, your pitcher in trouble, can't give feedback, but that's why coaches need to build the kind of relationship with their pitchers where if they need to say something, not they not only know when to say it, but they know how to say it. But the pitcher has to be somebody who has shown you that he has that skill. Like I could, I could know that I could say that to a pitcher. I, and by, by the way, just for the record, I have never done that. In fact, I sit at home sometimes and see a pitcher on TV that I work with. I'm like, oh no, I wish I could tell him. But you can be sure that after the game, he said, did you see anything in that one inning? And I go, yes, I did. And so for future reference, when you're in late innings and this happens to your such and such pitch, know that that's your tendency and all you have to do is blah, blah. And this is like simple. This isn't a complicated conversation. He's like, awesome. And you know what he'll always finish with? I felt that. I was doing that. So it depends on the relationship, but absolutely know how to communicate. But it's always great if the pitcher is taught to be able to self-correct. You don't want to impose yourself on a pitcher that you've never done that with in the middle of a game. You may have to say to yourself, hmm, I'm going to have to establish this kind of relationship where I can do this. But basically, we don't want to be doing this during the performance because it's external. We want to teach our pitchers how to get themselves out of jams. And that's what my job is so that I don't have to feel like I need to go tell a pitcher something. I never would. And by the way, I don't even go to my pitcher's games because uh, I like them to not feel like, you know, they're being analyzed all the time. And, uh, you know, it's just I give them that space because that's not my job. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So, Angel, let's move into the teaching moment. What do you want to talk about today for your teaching moment? Well, you know, this week, uh, watching the MLB draft and watching the kinds of qualities that the pitchers have that were drafted and uh, things that you heard everybody say when they were describing them. And of course, reaching, reading scouting reports for the last month and just a, a lot of information. You know, I, when I saw the excitement in these kids uh, and experienced it, of course, uh, myself with some clients, it, it is so awesome. And it made me more passionate about my work. But one of the things I just became obsessed with is the interesting factor that I actually learned in school. In school, when you're becoming what I do, they say, okay, what are the characteristics of certain players? So for example, the NFL, the linemen have to be one way, the wide receivers have to be another way. In basketball, the height, blah, blah. And of course, baseball pitching height is everything. So I said to myself, wow, height is so important. And then you start to realize, oh, and guess what? I don't care how many circles we make around the tree about deceptions important and locations important. Uh, Velocity is in the end. uh, The underlying thing that has to accompany (laughs) the deception and the location. And so even though I like go, oh boy, the truth is, especially these days, you have to be you have to be good at pitching 
obviously using your pitches correctly, but velocity is something that you should have it if you can have it. And that's the, the topic is that, th- that I want to get to is that I believe that pitchers should absolutely be 100% certain that they are utilizing their body correctly to release the ball close to the plate in a stabilized fashion so they have the location before, not only before they start running around and looking for velocity, but before they start to even have judgments about their velocity. In other words, when a pitcher comes to me, and this last month, dur- during this month, uh, this is the time of the year when pitchers come and stay out here to work with me for a month. They come out here for projects. They say, you know what? I had a bad season. I got to play late travel ball this summer, but I need to fix something. You know, I can't, I can't show up at fall ball pitching the same way. And, and usually it's a velocity issue. They have lost their velocity. They can't increase their velocity. And the first thing I do is look to see of course, what are they doing that could possibly be inhibiting velocity that they already have? In other words, if a shoulder's rotating, let's say, so fast, and then an elbow's going so fast, is that ball that's coming from that rotational level being delivered as close to the plate as possible so that he's getting the max out of at least that amount of rotation that he's doing in his shoulder? If he's doing this that amount of rotation, but he's not getting over the front leg, he's not releasing the ball as close to the plate as possible, then I don't need to go to work with teaching him how to have better shoulder and elbow mechanics. I need to teach him how to handle his architecture better. So given this last week where I saw the difference in rounds, et cetera, based on height, based on velocity, I'm like, you know what? I am on a new passion here, which is to teach and educate coaches on how to spot is your pitcher, is every pitcher. I don't care if he's throwing 98. If he's making this flaw, if he's not releasing as close to the plate as possible, he's not throwing at his max velocity. And what I think we should all be concerned with is, are the pitchers we have right now throwing at their max velocity? And It doesn't matter if they're already throwing hard. If they're not throwing correctly to give their body the position in space to deliver the ball as close to the plate as possible, they're leaving some miles per hour on the mound because of the way they're delivering the ball. Now, so getting over the front leg and being stabilized while you do it. And so what I'm saying is when the pitcher is facing the plate, it, his whole body has now turned. He's facing his target. He has to have a trunk tilt that when he tilts, his shoulders will be usually in front of the foot. His arm will go with the trunk. His ball and his hand will be as close to the plate as possible. Notice I did not say his foot is as close to the plate as possible. I said his hand is as close to the plate as possible. And what that usually means is that if he had a belt on, the belt buckle would be somewhere around his heel, moving towards the middle of the foot as his back foot comes off the ground. And when you have this, you are pitching as if you're six foot five inches, meaning that the height is so important for a pitcher. But the reason why we like height is because his arms are going to be long and he's going to quote unquote release closer to the plate. This is why height is so important because they do release closer to the plate. And by the way, even the tall guys who don't do this, they're not maximizing their velocity as well. I mean, I've worked with guys that are very tall and it was like, why aren't you using your height? And then you've got a guy that's small and you're saying, listen, you got to use every inch of your body. So I think this is something that's so important to pay attention to. And what I want to do today is I want to talk to the coaches and to pitchers about how to maybe identify if this is a flaw 
that you could possibly have. And what this means is, and this is why I get so excited about it, Joe, the same ball, the same everything will have more miles. It'll be a faster pitch if you just make sure that you're doing this part of the motion correctly. You don't have to go running around buying all kinds of equipment to throw harder or doing this to throw harder or stand on your head to throw harder or drink six gallons of Gatorade to throw harder. All you have to do is do exactly what you're doing, but make sure the part of your motion that is the tilting forward and the releasing of the ball is happening correctly. Isn't that exciting to think of it that way? Yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, it, that means I don't have to worry about weighted balls and, and long tossing and all this other stuff. I just need to work with the body that I have. Now, here's the thing, though, where I think we get very confused at being a coach myself for a long time and hearing a lot of things from other coaches and seeing a lot of things that are taught, especially with taller pitchers. Coaches like to stretch out the stride in order to come to the final goal of getting the ball closer to the mm -hmm. plate. But from conversations you and I have had in the past, that is not necessarily the way to get the ball closer to the plate. Yet, you know, yet we still have lots of pitchers trying to stride further and further and further. Now, I think you're you're gonna get to this, but there are other ways of getting the ball closer to the plate than striding further. Well, if you're stride, so the, so let's, let's do this in pieces. And I love that you uh, asked this question because it's an important part of this because and you're not going to want to buy into this idea that, wow, we've got pitchers who could be throwing harder unless you understand these components. Now, again, I always say this coaches, you're geniuses. In your minds, because you don't have a background, all of you, in anatomy, kinesiology, movement, all the little intricacies, of course the layperson would think, I want this pitcher to release the ball as close to the plate as possible, so I want him to move down the hill as far as he can. Isn't that intuitive? Yeah. I mean, that's what you would think. So I don't blame anybody for thinking that. In fact, it's why I love teaching this because it's it's a, a different way to approach it. And the truth is, coaches, how many guys have you taught or how many pitchers do you know that have been trying to stride as far as they can, but their velocity has not gone up? They have not increased their uh, control. In other words, the, the, the theme that seems to be popular doesn't work. It's also why a lot of the gimmicks for teaching strides to be longer and get down the hill faster or longer or whatever, they don't really work either. So the truth is the hand releases the ball. The arm is attached to your trunk. Everybody knows this. You know where your arm socket is. It's attached to your trunk. If you were sitting down and you reached out to grab something and you needed to reach closer, you couldn't get up from the chair, but you were trying to reach further, everybody do it now, you're going to, at the hip, you're going to lean forward and you're going to keep reaching, reaching, reaching. And that is how the hand goes forward. Now you're sitting in the chair, so your hips are back, so you're only reliant on how far the trunk gets out there. And the truth is, your arm is connected to your trunk. So where your trunk goes, your arm goes, and it's got the extra few feet to it, so now it's reaching. So if you're sitting at your desk and you're trying to reach way over the front of your desk and you're tilting, 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 and you haven't lifted up out of your seat, you are going to see that the more you flex in that trunk, the more the trunk goes forward, the more the arm goes forward. And then you're going to make that whatever it is you're grabbing for. The arm is attached to the trunk. So what we're really saying is we want the trunk to be free to reach forward. Now, last week we talked about our last podcast. I said, this is how you can lose velocity by creating that lean too soon because then you have nowhere to go. 
So that was a different issue. And anybody who was wondering about that, I think that was on our last podcast, right, Joe? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, and I don't want to confuse issues. So the trunk, the connection between that podcast message and this one is where the trunk is, is going to tell you where the hand's going to be, correct? Because it's an appendage coming off the top of the trunk. Now, when a stri- what is the stride? The stride is the stabilizing factor so that the pitcher can do what he needs to do to lean over his legs. If his foot is out too far because he decided to violate the length of his bones and just kind of jump out, let's say he leaps from his back leg to his front leg, or let's say he's going so fast that his foot reaches out, but his hip and his knee do not stay together with that foot. In other words, everybody picture this. When you slide on ice and you fall, it's because your foot slipped out from underneath you. Does everybody get that? Does that make sense, Joe? We always say yes. that we lost our footing. The right. foot the foot gets in front. If your foot gets too far out in front of your knee and your hip and then it just hits the ground and it's out so far that your back leg's length isn't enough to rejoin the knee joint over the ankle and push the hip over the knee. So you've got this little ankle, knee, hip relationship that makes you stable. You're going to have a front leg that is probably, looks completely straight, but angled backwards. The foot's out, the next angle backwards, the knee, the next angle backwards, the hip, and the pitcher's leaned over with his trunk, but his shoulders are like behind where his heel is. Because his trunk can't, it's extended fully, but it couldn't go fully out because the leg was pulled backwards. So the leg limited the position of the trunk in space. In other words, the trunk did not go forward. It was it went backwards because the leg moved it backwards because the trunk is sitting on top of the legs. Does that make sense? Well, it sounds like if you stride too far, you could actually be further away from the plate than you should be. Yes. In fact, I have many pitchers have hired me for that showing on film the exact thing that I'm saying. So here's what you do, coaches. So I want you all right now to be on this little trip to see are my guys already throwing throwing harder than they actually are? Are they throwing as hard as they actually are or are they taking, you know, taking longer for the ball to get to the plate because the release points uh, not as far as it could be as close to the plate. So I want you to stand to the side. If you're using film, it's perfect. You have to be able to at the moment of release, you have to be able to stop the film and look at that. So here's what I call it. When you look from the side, I call it pitching from a chair. I tell the guy, you look like you're sitting down and you're pitching with your butt behind you and you haven't leaned forward. And so they laugh and we look at it and they go, oh my gosh, it is what I look like. And what it looks like is a pitcher that turns and he never really goes forward with his body. He puts his hand out there, but his butt stays backwards and it looks like he's literally sitting in a chair instead of having his hips be up and over his front leg. And when I say the front leg, the, the, the bone from the ankle to the knee should be pretty vertical. Okay. We have a little few degrees where it could be back, but I'm not going to say that because I want to teach this so black and white that you could see it. The, if the cat, if the bone between the ankle and the knee isn't vertical, And then the thigh, when you look at it from the side, it'll look like it's about 45 degrees angle. The trunk cannot reach out over the front leg. You'll know he's getting everything out of his pitch because his shoulders will be forward of his foot. So this is how you look to see if your pitcher is suffering from not being over the front leg. Now, here is my favorite drill, and I think I can explain this easily. So what you do is you you have the pitcher stand, and he can do it flat ground or you can do it on the hill. He faces the plate, 
and you ask them, first of all, you ask the catcher to come in about 10 feet away and you have, you have the pitcher take his glove off. You give him a ball and you tell him he's going to throw underhand. And the pitcher, the catcher is about 10, 15 feet away. You have him get on one leg. So he's a right-handed pitcher. It's as if he did a lunge and then he came up on top of that leg. So what you're having him do is balance on one leg, making sure he's got his lower leg bone vertical. His knee is bent. His back leg is off the ground, by the way. So you're doing a little balancing act so he can see what he needs to do with the leg to be able to stabilize it. He's literally on one leg. So he actually looks like he's in a follow through position. You know, the ones we see that are perfect. He's tilted forward and he starts playing catch on one leg, underhanding the ball. Of course, no force, just back and forth. You have him do that for as many times as he can. Because the guy who doesn't know how to keep a little bend in his knee will keep falling over. He'll figure out how it feels to be forward over his leg when he's on one leg, because that is actually where the body's headed during the acceleration part. And when you, and then film him. And when this pitcher sees that his shoulders are six inches in front of his foot and he's balancing that way, he will start to feel the courage it takes to be out in front because it does. And also the work it takes in the leg to be right underneath the body, but the allowance that it gives the trunk and the arm to reach way forward. So at this point, he's just playing catch underhanded. He's not trying to do the reach or anything like that. He's just seeing where his center of mass has to be placed over his leg so that he can understand how it feels to be perfectly balanced over the front leg. And when he feels that, and then he sees it, he's going to be, whoa. And then he starts to integrate that. And then, of course, you can have your teaching methods to teach that. But that's the way you can look right now to see if your guys are getting the most out of their bodies and also teach them how it feels to actually be centered over the leg. Wow. Uh, you know, Angel, I, that's a, that's a great tip. And I would caution people who look to major league pitchers for like what the best, what the best mechanics are, because I think that if you looked at most major league pitchers, I don't think that they get over their front leg. I think there are, there are guys that are throwing a hundred miles an hour and not getting over their front leg, which is kind of scary. Yeah, some of them. Yeah. And I have a favorite pitcher that doesn't. And I, so here's the deal. You know, I, if I'm around a pitcher and I'm seeing what he's doing, you have to know when he's not doing, if he's really, really good and he's not doing it, you have to be able to figure out why. Uh, And also you have to, you have to evaluate certain things, but you're absolutely right. Because historically the way it was taught It was taught to put the leg in front and then to pull the knee backwards for bracing. Those that terminology of bracing is used. Also, there are sports, the javelin, for example, where they tell you to straighten the knee for stability, but the javelin is done straight up and down and you're straightening the leg for stability for a different reason because you're there's a whole different architecture. So people who had the best intention took information like that and taught reach out and then pu- snap the leg back for momentum on the front leg, not realizing and connecting the dots to the part where we need the hand to be closer to the plate. Now, why am I talking about this? Because the thing that I got is velocity is really important. And as much as I hate all these programs to try to get it, the reason why so many are out there and the reason why all of you have spent so much money on them is because it is important. So I'm agreeing that it's important, but let's make sure that we're doing this part, which in the end will increase your velocity immediately. And it's safer. And guess what? It's in the direction of which I always like mechanics to go, which is in the direction of efficiency. Oh, and guess what, Joe? When you're out in front of the leg, 
the release point, the trajectory out of the hand is completely different. Can you can you just in your mind understand that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So if you talk about keeping the ball down, you know, because you are taking your trunk in your arm downhill at the point of the hill where it goes downhill, if you step downhill and pull backwards, you're changing the trajectory on the release as well, which is another little added benefit. So, but, you know, guys, if you want to throw harder, make sure you're doing this. And I think all the emphasis we place on velocity, let's start placing it on, hey, let's get that hand closer to the plate. And I think this is one way to do it. And that way we're satisfying everyone, everyone's need for more velocity and my personal need for efficient mechanics. Well, if I were a major league hitter, I would be very frightened if major league pitchers heard what you just said about getting over the front leg because I would gather that a lot of major league pitchers, maybe 90% of them would probably gain another yeah. three to five miles an hour, if not more, if they, if they knew how to do this correctly. Yeah. And I'm on a mission right now. Uh, I, you know, as you know, I get obsessed with certain things and this month it's this, and I'm on a mission and I can't tell you the results I've been getting by being so committed to this. And with each pitcher, you teach you have to teach something different to try to help him get this. But do that little drill so he can see what it takes. And I can tell you, I always say, have you ever been out that far when you're pitching? And they look and go, never. And once they feel that, you know, pitchers are like, give me more. I want to do this. And sometimes that's all you need to do. And they know how to to get it done. So Anyway, so I hope that uh, uh, I've, I've got everybody on a mission. All right. Sounds good. Talking about giving us more, we're at the end of the episode, and uh, I need a closer, but I'm going to need a two-inning save here. Do you think you're up to the oh, task? I think I can come up with two important things. And, you know, good closers, we can be called in a little early if we need to be. So, yeah, I'm ready. I'm all warmed up, ready to go. All right. Well, this is your show. Let's hear what you have for the final innings. Come in, closer. Well, as as I said, you know, my obsession is always something and everyone knows my obsession for the last month has been the change up. But and I found the coolest, most awesome thing when I was troubleshooting a pitcher's problem with this change up. Now, one of the most and so I have to share it with you coaches because it's so cool. Some of you probably already have caught this, but it's so simple. So most of the criticism that coaches give pitchers when they say they're working with their pitchers is that the pitcher is trying to slow the ball down. He's trying, he's taking too much off of it. He's being tentative. We all know that because the pitch it goes slower. They don't understand why it goes slower, but they're trying to make it go slower. So I had a pitcher who was uh, having a problem with the, the it not getting over the plate. So I'm looking at this, looking at this in a million different ways. And finally, I go, wait a minute, let me transcribe this a little differently. If a ball doesn't make it as far as it's supposed to, it's not going fast enough, right? Or it's not going, something changed with the trajectory. So I'm like, hmm. So I did some experimenting and I looked at some film. And what I did is I I created a situation that I could film. And what I looked at was the fastball release and that, of course, always went over the plate. And I happened to get a, a video of a changeup that didn't make it over the plate. And I was able to see that, yes, and, and I already knew, any coach would have known this, this pitcher is trying to take something off his changeup. And he, even with discussion around it, didn't know what it was. So he finally came to me and for this specific reason. And so I said, well, let me take a look. Uh, by the way, this didn't come in five minutes. I'm not, it takes me a while to sort of connect dots, especially when it comes to differences in pitches. But anyway, to get to the chase here, uh, when I filmed him, guess what he was doing to slow down the pitch? He was not straightening his elbow the same way that you straighten it as for a fastball. His elbow was bent. It almost looked like he was throwing a curveball. But of course, he's using a grip for a changeup. So, what I mean, it was so obvious. So, 
I went up to him. This is a really good picture. And I said, look at this. Did you know your elbow is supposed to be just like a fastball? You know the saying, throw it like a fastball, right? And, you know, science has looked at different angles and uh, the change up elbow and fastball elbows is supposed to be the same. He was using a completely different elbow. He looks, he goes, ah, oh, well, you know, in his head, he's trying to slow things down. And what's interesting is he knew just how to do it, not to use the elbow correctly. Goes back to the rubber, says, okay, starts throwing some fastballs. I said, throw some fastballs and feel your elbow straightening. So this is how I teach. Throw fastballs, feel your elbow straightening. Feel it straighten, feel it straighten. I go, okay, now throw a change up and think about the straightening of the elbow, the way you just were thinking about it. And when he straightened the elbow, the ball went over the plate. He's like, oh my God. And then because he's the pitcher and I don't, you know, I'm not a pitching coach. I'm a movement coach. But I respect these guys. So if I give him that little piece of information, he can then take that and run with it to make the adjustments with it or do whatever it takes. But by him understanding that where he was making the error was in the extension of his elbow, which would be the shape of the arm, which, by the way, would affect the wrist. And what what do we say about change-ups? Well, all pitches, it's in the wrist and the grip, right? Beautiful adjustment. So coaches, if you've got camera, although you guys uh, don't even need cameras most of the time, but go behind, have him throw a fastball, have him throw a changeup, make sure he's extending the elbow. This is in the case of pitchers that where you go, he's trying to make it go slow. Something's wrong. And when the wrist is wrong, the changeup won't work. And if the elbow's wrong, it's not going to work. And especially if it's not getting over the plate. So anyway, there's my little last bit of, that's my eighth inning. How'd I do? That was pretty good, but we still have the ninth to take care of. And, you know, in our last episode, you talked about it just briefly during the teaching moment. We were talking about a flaw in the pitching motion And I brought in a parallel flaw, a very similar flaw in the hitting motion, hitting mechanics. It's called leaking forward. And somehow we got onto the tangent of what you were describing as was soft toss and how when you do these soft toss drills, it's not really like, you know, might not be the best way to teach or practice hitting. And I'm thinking, all right, well, I don't even want to talk about what happens when we put the ball on a tee because this is a pitching show and not a hitting show. But I understand that you have something to say now about hitting off of a tee. <laughs> yes, I do. So you know how you know how that saying is like I, I guess for you parents out there, you have a three year old and they say something so like at first it sounds so dumb and then you go, "Whoa, that is really smart." It's uh, it, when you're a teacher, you always listen to the crazy things students say because. Sometimes you go, hmm, or I look at mistakes people make in the gym and I go, that's not what I told you to do, but that's a very interesting movement. Well, so you could consider me one of those babies because, of course, even though hitting's not my thing, when you're trained as a sports scientist, we're trained to look at things to see if you're accomplishing the objective you're supposed to be accomplishing. I mean, to even to be a strength and conditioning coach, uh, you have to understand every sport, the requirements and, you know, so... I, I, I don't, of course, do anything with hitting, but I couldn't resist when you asked me about hitting off the tee because I thought, wow, you know, I don't even know why they do it. I know nothing about hitting, everyone. I just want you to know, even though I had to analyze hitting in school, it's not something I, uh, you know, I mean, I know it's got similarities. I know nothing about the bat hitting the ball. I couldn't even tell you how much a bat weighs. But anyway, I was I started becoming obsessed wondering about it and so I decided to watch major league pitchers uh hitting off the tee. And within a few minutes my mouth started watering and I said hitting off the tee is awesome and I'll tell you why I thought it was awesome. Are you surprised to hear me say this, Joe? I'm a little surprised, yeah. Yeah, I figured you would be. Well, this is how I'm looking at it. So again, you guys know that I am someone who doesn't think things are necessarily good or bad. I just think you have to label them correctly. For example, you always have heard me say, 
I don't know how I feel about long toss, but all I do know is you're not practicing your pitching when you're doing long toss. You can't be. It's just not even near what pitching is. You know, so I have a problem when people say, I do this to get better at this. If it has nothing to do with it, you're just kidding yourself. Well, when I look at the hitting, I'm like, okay, I don't know if this is why guys do it, but this is actually what it would do. So what happens, what, so here's the thing, and this is, again, take this from out of the mouth of a baby to see if I'm saying anything smart. Now, I'm an Olympic weightlifting coach. Olympic weightlifting is the sport where you snatches and clean and jerks are the two movements of Olympic weightlifting. The job is to move a weight over from the ground over your head. And there's one movement, the snatch, it goes in one movement and the clean and jerk, you get it from the floor to the shoulders and then you go over your head. You have to move that bar in a straight line. There's all kinds of intricacies. And because it's heavy, you, as you train and it gets heavier, the bar is going to move slower. So you have to have more power because the bar is moving slower because it's heavier. So a guy who's doing a snatch with a lightweight is going to move the bar faster, but the guy who's moving a heavier bar slower, he's probably more powerful. So the connection with this is this, the ball is not moving. So every inch that the ball goes is coming from the power of the hitter. So first I want to talk about the hitting as a strength training tool. So the ball's distance is equal to only the power of the hitter. What a cool strength training tool for hitting. Because you the ball's not hitting the bat and you're getting the power of the the forces. Do you get what I'm saying? This is why I guess you don't go yard when you're hitting off a tee unless you're like one of those great guys in the MLB that could probably do it. But do you see what I'm saying? So what a great strength training tool. And in fact, I don't want to get complicated and start throwing out terms, but there is a certain type of strength that you would be developing. And it's an awesome strength to add to the component of the type of power you get when the ball is actually moving. So first of all, what a wonderful strength training tool. There's no, when we go in the gym, we don't try to make an exercise look like hitting. You know, that's kind of weird. That's people who, you don't try to make something look like hitting, but you try to build the muscles that are used when you hit. But this is the type of movement where it's direct strength. It's like, it's perfect. And then the other thing that I loved about it is I am assuming that there's a certain spot on the bat, and I guess it would be the sweet spot, where you have to learn to make contact. The ball and that, but the bat and the ball have the best relationship when they hit it, when they make contact in that one area. I'm assuming that that's probably true. And what a wonderful tool for one, working on that because the ball isn't moving, but what you're getting. Hitting hitting a non-moving ball is not going to teach you how to get the sweet spot on a moving ball, but what it's going to give you is feedback from the sound, the feel, and something about your arrangement to the ball that's going to transfer over to what you're going to do when the ball is moving. And the feedback an athlete gets, this is why I like my pitchers to work with a catcher and not a net. In fact, somebody called and asked me that, and I may have actually mentioned this on a podcast. I, the pitcher needs to hear the ball hit the glove. That's telling him something, just like we like to have, you know, the catcher frame the pitches because the the pitcher's picking up feedback. You don't know you're doing it, but you're picking it up visually. He's watching where the ball moves. He's seeing where it ended. He's hearing the ball hit the glove. The hitter, I am certain absolutely certain that his ears are picking up information, his wrists, his forearms. And think about this, because it's such a cool strength tool, when you hit off a tee, and let's say you're in a baseball field doing it, you could tell day by day if you're getting stronger, because if it goes further, it's like lifting a heavier weight. It's like putting up better numbers. 
I loved it. And I think as a strength training tool, it's fantastic. And of course, this all goes with that the swing um, is safe and been taught correctly by a coach, <laughs> not just a two-year-old getting up there smashing the ball. You know, we're talking about right. a hitter and it, its usefulness. So what do you think about what I said? Out of the mouth of a baby, remember that. Did I say anything that makes sense? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we uh, generally use the T just to get reps and, and how to like hone our, our hitting mechanics. But now I'm thinking... Now there's something to do with those weighted balls that you purchased and are not going to use for pitching. We could put them on the tee and maybe it'll force us to use even more force to hit the Mm. ball with. Well, I never, yeah. Now I never recommend changing the weight of a implement that you do a sport with. I think it's a bad idea. I'm not talking about hitting a heavier ball. You're kidding right now, right? See, I just took you seriously. Are you laughing (gasps) over there? Of course. (laughs) Of course. I mean, well, it's either that or... Or are we just dropping into a, a pond somewhere? No, they look really good in a bowl. They're all different colors. I love them. <laughs> hey, they're great for yeah, like they're great ball. for wrist work. But anyway, uh, anyway, so um, yeah, so from that from that perspective, and again, I remind everybody, um, I look at things from training uh, training viewpoints and also objectives and also what can be gotten from it. And uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I really did. And especially when I was watching guys that are really good at hitting and I could, you know, and I thought, wow, wow. Anyway, so there it is. How did I do in the ninth inning? Did I strike out the side again? Okay, awesome. So I've got my, I keep my job then. You, you keep your job. We got the save. Awesome. Uh, I, I don't, we're not going to start the, uh, baseball hitting the fix anytime soon but i <laughs> i think that it was a fun thing to cover so yeah and all you hitting coaches out there that are shaking your head saying angel keep your day job <laughs> yeah i hear you <laughs> anyway well still that that was a fun perspective uh, yeah. uh thank you for that angel exactly. and, and thank you for all the information today i think okay. i think we learned a lot yeah <laughs> awesome i think we learned a lot today yeah so uh thank you again for listening to Season 5, Episode 5. If you want to learn more about Angel, it's only going to be pitching there. You can go to Angel's website, gymscience.com. And if you have a question for an upcoming episode or a topic you want covered, or maybe you want to hire Angel for some pitching help, you can email her at angel at gymscience.com. We'll be back again in about two weeks. And in the meantime, I want to wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound.